everybody. Welcome back to this Tan Books podcast. I'm Paul Kengor. I've got Steve Cunningham, who's the producer. And we have here today Dr. Stacy Trasankos and Father George Elliott. And they're talking about their new book, Behold, It Is I, Scripture, Tradition, and Science in the Real Presence. And this is a fascinating book. It's just been done by Tan Books. In fact, um, confession here, I don't even have a, I don't have a hard copy yet. I got, I got a PDF. And so it's, um, you know, normally as I've done these podcasts and the before people can watch and see, I hold the book and I've got it all marked up and I, and I read from annotations. So I can't do that here today, but I've got the PDF in front of me, got a whole bunch of questions. This is su- such an important work, but let me just begin first by saying, um, Stacy, Father George, uh, welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Sure, sure. Hey. So we're going to start this. Wow, uh, this this is this is a fascinating book. It's divided into three parts. First, what does the Bible say? Two, what do the church fathers say? And then three, what does science say? So very much, you know, like the title says, scripture, traditions, uh, sci- and science in the real presence. I, I, my own background to this, and I think this might be similar to Stacy as well. I'm a convert. I, I'm a convert to Catholicism. I've talked about this on the show a number of times. I don't think I ever talked about this on the show, and I probably will a little bit today, but I want to talk more about the book uh, rather than my own experience. One of the major reasons I came into the church was the real presence, the, the real presence of, of Christ in the Eucharist. And I think I've told the story before on one of these podcasts uh, this kind of moment of decision when I was trying to figure out what am I going to do? Am I going to convert? My wife was ready to come into the church. We were in a Presbyterian church, USA church, PC USA. And we were in the backyard and we got this note from our church and it was concerning our oldest son, our oldest child. And it said that it was time for him to start taking classes on receiving his first communion. And my wife, I can still remember this. She, you know, she, she held up, this letter in the backyard and said, okay, what do you want them to teach your son about the Eucharist? (laughs) Right. And so that was kind of a line in the sand. And I said, all right, give me, and I I set a date. I I got to make a decision by this point. And I completely immersed myself in exactly this question of the real presence. And my pastor, God bless him, such a great guy. He tried to talk me out of it by giving me books, um, trying to debunk the church fathers and saying that um, Augustine believed it was just a symbol and not the real presence and so forth. All of which, when I read that book, only as I checked that book, convinced me even more and more that the Roman Catholic Church was, was right on this. So I got to a point in 2005 where I decided that's it. I'm coming in, came into the church. And so with that set up for my own personal story, um, I'll start with Stacy, I guess, and then Father George. Tell us about um, how you came to this question, how you came to this topic, and, uh, and you know, that, that's, uh, that's how you came to this book. Stacy. Well, I came to this book kind of actually you would think that I would I would say that science brought me to this book but it's actually the other way around one of the biggest messages I try to convey consistent with Father Stanley Yockey the the priest and physicist whose work I study is your faith should never be dependent on science as wonderful as science is it is not where we draw our faith Um, nature is creation. Creation is the handiwork of God. We can look in in creation and be inspired that God exists and be inspired at his handiwork, but our faith should never rest on science. And so I actually was a little disappointed in some of the research with with the Eucharistic miracles and wanted a chance um, to look into those more. And um, it, that, that whole question about what does science say about the Eucharistic miracles led us to write the last part of this book. But Father Elliot has the real proofs of the real presence in the Eucharist. Well, well, let me stop you right there. And by the way, I got to tell people watching this that Stacy is in a Mustang, a 2020 Mustang <laughs> and, and wearing sunglasses. So, so she gets the award for looking the coolest. <laughs> uh, of, of anybody who's, 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 who's ever done the show. But, but, but on, on that point, if I could just stop you right there, Stacy. I mean, one thing that's really frustrated me, you know, um, as, as somebody who's, you know, done graduate work and, and I was in the hard sciences too. I was actually a biochem biophysics major. 
Um, worked for the organ transplant team at the University of Pittsburgh. It's a long story. Uh, my PhD isn't in that. It's in political science. But but at, like I'm doing a book right now for Tan Books on another subject. I won't talk about it today. But but it involves going through a lot of websites, and it is so hard to pin down accurate yeah. data. There is so much junk out there. You find yourself mm-hmm. like screaming at, at the at the at the computer screen, uh, uh, uncharitably but berating the people who put together the website, right? You know, for not spelling things correctly, for not sourcing things. Where does this come from? Where does that come from? Where does this? So you really have to do a lot of your own digging and, and, and fact checking and putting together something like this. Yes. And the way it started out, I mean, there's a whole story behind this book, of course. It, it really started out with Bishop Strickland asking me to do talks on the Eucharistic miracles. And I did those talks, but I prefaced it with, a hesitation. I said, I I am just repeating stories. And as a chemist, I'm not comfortable just repeating other people's interpretation of the data. Um, And I I prayed about it. I prayed, dear God, it'd really be nice if I could see that data. Um, And it it turns out that the lead investigator for the Buenos Aires miracles, um, the Eucharistic miracles, actually walked up to Bishop Strickland outside of Sydney, Australia, when he was there visiting his family and handed him the data. And wow. he mailed it to me and said, there you go, Stacy. Um, careful what you pray for. <laughs> wow. So, but wow. but, but it, I ended up with the data. And so I really didn't have a choice but to look at it. And, and Father Elliot knows, because he was with me all along the way, it's not, it's not good. Like the investigations weren't done as well as they could have been. And and I started to have serious concerns about how much people are putting their faith in the real presence in the Eucharistic miracles, how much of those stories are repeated uncritically. So the book might shake some people up when they read it because I didn't just repeat the stories. Good, good. Okay, well, well, let's get back to that. Uh, Father George, let, let's um, tell us about your background, how you came to this. And, and I should add that you both are in uh, Bishop Strickland's diocese, right? Is this a, a Tyler, Texas, correct? And, correct? and he wrote the foreword to this book. He did. Exactly. That's right, yes. So uh, I myself grew up in uh, the Diocese of Tyler in Paris, Texas. Um, I went to the Air Force Academy and actually while I was at the Air Force Academy, um, I realized I was kind of I was I was running away from God by going to the military. They, they talked about duty and service and answering the call and all of this. And so it was actually kind of the the formation at 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 the Air Force Academy that pushed me to actually answer the call to the priesthood. Um, and I entered the seminary as a diocesan seminarian for the Diocese of Tyler and studied for three years at St. Charles Borromeo in Philadelphia. Then I was sent to Rome and studied at the University of the Holy Cross in Rome. That's the Opus Dei University. And then I went to the Augusti- uh, Augustinianum, which is the, the Patristic Institute in Rome. And I got my license from there. And so what, now, yeah, did anything happen over there? Maybe, maybe I want to talk about the, the uh, Laciano miracle. Did you, did you see things over there that are related to precisely this issue of Eucharistic miracles and so forth, other than your academic training, I suppose, right? Absolutely. Yeah. I, I had the, really one of the kind of highlights of my time in Rome was that as a deacon, I was able to go to Orvieto and participate in that beautiful Eucharistic procession that they have on the Feast of Corpus Christi. And they they have deacons, and they, well, they have this, this big platform that they carry the, the corporal of the Eucharistic miracle in. And then at the very top of this platform is a little monstrance with uh, our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. And so I was able to, to be one of the deacons that carried the, the miracle and the Blessed Sacrament in that Eucharistic procession. And so that was one of those times when I really, I really fell in love with um, these Eucharistic miracles. So, okay, I guess this is jumping ahead a little bit, but now the now the one at, at Orvieto, so it's O R V I uh, E T O. Now exactly. that now that that is the, is that the Laciano uh, uh, miracle? It is not. No. So the the Orvieto Bolsena miracle is is one, um, and it, the corporal is in uh, uh, Orvieto, but the the stone, the altar stone that the 
um, Blood Fell On To is in uh, Bolsena and it happened in Bolsena. And then um, the Lanciano one was actually quite uh, prior to that. I'll let actually, Dr. Trasancos is the one that can- That's the first one, about. right, that we know of, like around the year 750 AD. Yes. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, the Lanciano miracle is is probably the most famous miracle that um, most people think about when they think of the Eucharistic miracles. And it, you know, I looked into, there's something called the Linoli Report. It is a, a full investigation done by a medical doctor back in the early 70s, um, Leonardo, um, Ed, Eduardo Linoli. And he actually did such a thorough investigation. It was published in a scientific journal and, and I had access to that. I found it in a book and translated and took a look at that. And, and he did a very uh, pious, devout investigation. But what we have to understand is when Linoli came to doing his investigation of the, the blood clots and the flesh, the, the host had turned into flesh and the blood had dried into five clots which is what you can see to this day. He came at it not asking the question, can science prove this miracle happened? He came at the investigation, this miracle happened. He capitalized body, capitalized blood, the miraculous body, the miraculous blood. He assumed the miracle already happened and he did his investigation. And, and you know, he found that the, the tissue looked like heart tissue and he blood typed the blood and all of that. And it was a very well done investigation for the early 70s. But, uh, you know, it, as a chemist speaking, those investigations are not conclusive. Like the reason that they would never be absolutely conclusive and the kind of certainty we want from science that science can't give us on anything is there, there's no chain of custody with mm -hmm. these samples. Right. There, there is, it's impossible to get a chain of custody. Um, the earliest time anybody starts writing about these miracles is like a quarter of a century later. Um, so we, we have the samples. Um, we just don't have any way to know all the way back whether the legend is actually true or not. And the scientific data, while it does look like it's really flesh and really blood, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't really prove that it was a bread that turned into flesh or wine that turned into blood. Um, and even when I look carefully at his data, there's some questions about the way the blood typing was done. There's some questions about the electrophoresis. Uh, I think a scientist today would look at that and say it's at best inconclusive. Okay. But, but, but still compelling nonetheless, um, if not, if not completely conclusive, I think it's compelling if you are willing to believe the testimony of men. But one thing we say in the book is we should always be ready to believe in the testimony of Jesus Christ more than the testimony of men. And so the chain the chain of custody issue. So in other words, you don't know for sure if it, if it's exactly what was allegedly there in 750 AD, right? Maybe maybe yeah. kind of like akin to the Shroud of Turin, maybe, right? You don't mm -hmm. know if it's it was actually there if it can be dated to the year 33, right? Uh, I yeah. mean, you can still look at it and say, okay, it appears that something happened here mm -hmm. with this fabric or with this tissue that we're holding, but I can't say for sure that it comes from the year 750. Yeah, and it, it doesn't rule out other other that it's not other things like other primate blood, or it doesn't rule out that someone didn't switch it. And I'm not trying to prove that's the case. I'm not right, trying to prove right. that the, that's the case at all. But what I'm trying, what more than anything, I want to put a damper on people's uncritical faith in science. I'm a chemist. Sure. I can say that. I want to put a damper on it. There have been some things associated with that miracle that were found out not to be true. Like it is said in the first time they ever examined the blood clots, the five blood clots, that each one of those pieces of blood, dried blood, weighed exactly the same as every other piece. So all five pieces, exactly the same weight each. And then when all five pieces were put on the scale, the five together had that same exact weight, which would indeed be miraculous. But what people leave out 
even in the international exhibition on the Eucharist that, that the Vatican put together and travels around the world, it even still says in that book that each, that same thing, that each of the five blood clots weighs the same and all five together weigh the same. But what you find in the record, even in the Linoli report, that was only found to be the case the very first time and all other verifications ever since for hundreds of years, Ever, the people measuring it have always known that's not true anymore, that it mm. that it's not repeatable. And yet, even today, I've been to teen conferences where that very myth is repeated. And it it's known, it's known not to be the case. The other example is there's said to be a WHO report from the World Health Organization in Geneva and New York, where scientists were compelled after 500 tests to admit that science had come to its limits and that something miraculous occurred. That report turned out to be a fraud. Um, a medical doctor went and looked at that report and it was it was a report on an Egyptian mummy with the front page replaced with the Lanciano miracle. Mm. Um, and so we gotta be careful about repeating those things because God forbid a young person hear that and then find out the truth and say, what else are y'all lying about to get right, me to believe right. in the Eucharist? Right. No, that, and that's why this is so critical. Um, okay, then, then with the, okay, that's the Lachiano one. Tell us about, um, and I was going to start with Old Testament proofs and Melchizedek and so forth. I guess I'm working my way backwards, but the, can, can, uh, of the, of the ones that you talk about in the book, including Bonus Ares, uh, which, uh, which do you find the most compelling of all the alleged Eucharistic miracles or perhaps most conclusive as far as we can tell? I picked those three, the, the Orvieto, Bolsena, and Lanciano, because they're the three most popular. And I find them all inconclusive. I mean, there was no scientific investigation done with the Orvieto miracle. But in the historical accounts, the historians say there are inconsistencies. Um, the, the Orvieto miracle was a, a legend that people talked about, and we still celebrate, like Father Elliot was saying, but in the history, the, the two biographers of, of Pope Urban IV, who, who instituted the Feast of Corpus Christi, they don't mention the miracle. And he apparently instituted that feast the year after the miracle allegedly occurred, and there's no mention of it. There's no mention of it in the liturgies that St. Thomas Aquinas wrote for the Feast of Corpus Christi. And the historian's question, if if the miracle was the reason for the institution of this first universal feast in the whole church, it seems like somebody would have mentioned the miracle in so, all of that. And, it, and it's not mentioned. So there's that. How, how many, um, I, I actually have a book on this. So it's not within reach, but um, how many authenticated or affirmed, or I'm, I'm trying to find the right word, Church approved. If there if there are such things, um, Euchar Eucharistic miracles have have there been. In the book, the Vatican exhibition that um, that Blessed Carlo Acutis put together, and and the Real Presence Foundation um, passes around the world. I, I forget the exact number because I don't have it in front of me, but there's something like 140 something miracles. Okay, and they at Absolutely any of them could be true. God can work a miracle anytime, any way. We absolutely have to believe that. It's the only logical conclusion faith in a creator will lead to. Um, but I think what I think should happen is that there should be better investigations conducted of these miracles. Right. And mostly the message that Father Elliot and I wanted to convey, we didn't expect to come out in this place because I didn't expect the investigations to be done so poorly is regardless of science, we need to all really ask ourselves, do we need science to prove what we ought to hold in faith? Like, can right. we genuinely just believe in the word of Christ? And Father Elliot has all this beautiful tradition from script scripture and the church fathers um, that I will be the first person as a woman of faith who's also a chemist to say, that's where the certainty exists. Yeah. Well, Father Father Elliot, let's let's go to that. So you you we you actually start the book with part one, what does the Bible say, and then part two, what do the church fathers say, and part so part one, what does the Bible say, 
even before I, I, I got to that section, I was already drawn up my questions for, for you and Stacy. And I had written down uh, uh, John 6, the bread of life narrative, right? And then I saw in the book that you open up by saying, okay, well, everybody goes to the bread of life narrative, <laughs> right? Uh, Catholics do, but uh, but that doesn't work for Protestants, right? Um, you know, they, they don't believe in that. By the way, I, I would stop and say right there, I think a lot of Protestants, including me, where I was, once you see that and you really start reading that and you really start picking apart, picking it apart, you're immediately uncomfortable, right? I, I mean, it, it, it you you read that slowly and go back through it, and it, it's hard not to be convinced that he's talking about the real presence there. But but even before that, in John six, so you start with the Old Testament, right? What what can we take from the Old Testament? Even before we get to the New Testament, as um, types or typology, if you if you will, for for the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist. That's right. Yeah, you know the reason why I think it's important to start with the Old Testament um, is because the Eucharist is a big claim. You know that something that looks like bread and wine is actually the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ is is a really big claim, and so for Protestants where, you know, you may be able to sit them down at, you know, the the institution narratives and John chapter six and say, hey, look, this is clearly what these passages are talking about. There's this kind of hesitancy within them where they say, you know, how is it that something this important just pops up in the Gospels out of nowhere? You know, uh, the idea of the people of God, that's been laid out from the very beginning. The idea of, you know, the sacrifice, that's been laid out from the beginning. The, the idea of a Messiah, that's been laid out, laid out from the beginning. How is it that out of nowhere we get something this big? And so what that means is that we actually just haven't done the work of really showing them how the Eucharist has been laid out from the beginning. And so that's kind of the purpose of this, this first chapter, to look at... Um, the Old Testament and say, where where has the Eucharist been prefigured? Where where have we seen uh some signs of the Eucharist um, throughout the Old well, Testament? Well, okay, and and you and you say on page 18, and this is Exodus section 12, and here you talk about the Passover lamb, the Passover, and uh you know, I'll, I'll just I'll read from this. The this is page, let's see, page 17. To understand what it means that Jesus is the new Lamb of God, we have to understand the old Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb. And by the way, I got to tell you, when forget about when I was a Protestant, became Catholic, when I was an agnostic, and the first time that I under, read all of this from Hebrews in particular, and and saw the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament, this floored me, and this immediately finally made uh, made the New Testament and Christianity. It, it made sense to me when I when I read this. The Passover was the sacrifice that God commanded the Israelites to offer before he would lead them out of Egypt. God had sent nine plagues upon Egypt. The Israelites had to suffer the nine plagues with the Egyptians. But the tenth and last plague was too awful for God to allow the Israelites to suffer. And that was the death of the firstborn, right? The firstborn. After being slaughtered, the blood of the Passover lamb was sprinkled on the house doorsteps and later consumed. Now stop right there. Rethink what I just said and apply that to Jesus, all right? But we're not at Jesus yet. We're, we're at the Old Testament. This was the outward sign that prevented the firstborn from losing his life. And then, then you quote this and how they roasted the lamb and how they ate the lamb, right? Page 18, from this passage, we can draw out three points that are important for our study. One, the Passover lamb was to be unblemished, right? That, that's, that's Jesus. Two, the Passover lamb was killed and eaten on the same day. I'll let Father George explain that one. Three, the Passover was to be a memorial day every year and was to be a sacrifice offered forever, since the Passover lamb was a liturgical celebration offered every year, the rite slowly developed over time to explain and expand what the nucleus, nucleus text in Exodus commanded. Um, Father George, I'll, 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 let, I'll let you pick that up. Great, yeah. So, you know, those, those three points, obviously, the Passover lamb was to be unblemished. We actually see that coming up all the way at the, at the crucifixion. You know, it's, it's odd the two... Uh, robbers or the two thieves, they have bones broken 
Um, but Christ himself doesn't have any um, bones broken. He's, you know, stabbed with a lance. Um, and that's an Isaiah that, prophecy, right? That the not not a not a, a limb will be broken, not a bone will be broken. Exactly. And so the the idea of the unblemished lamb was, yeah, it was a kind of external unblemishedness, no no spot. Uh, um, and of course, that's interpreted as no sin within uh, Jesus Christ. And yet also it meant that that animal could never have had any broken bones, which I didn't get way into this in the book. But the fascinating thing is that oftentimes when animals broke bones, it was because they had essentially strayed from the flock. If the flock stayed right there in the middle of the pasture, they weren't going to break any bones. It was when they they kind of went off the path. Oh, wow. and uh got off by themselves then you know they would be attacked by animals or they would they would stumble over a you know in a crack or something of that sort and even you know the image of the the good shepherd we always see the good shepherd has the lamb on his shoulders uh what the good shepherd would do when a lamb um, wandered from the flock was actually break the back leg of the lamb to associate with the, being away from the flock the pain of that broken leg. So essentially wow. it was kind of a training of uh, to the animal of saying, hey, look, you stick with the flock, you don't get hurt. You go away from the flock, you do get hurt. And then, of course, uh, the shepherd would then have to pick up the lamb, put him on his shoulders to carry him back because the, the poor lamb's leg had been broken. And it was a kind of uh, way that, um, you know, showed that, that the good shepherd sometimes allowed some suffering in the lives of the lamb to actually help the lamb to grow. But anyway, so this idea of Jesus being unblemished also meant that he never strayed from the flock, never strayed from the people of God. Wow. So now that I had not thought of. And, and so and so he and he's the ultimate firstborn. He's the ultimate unblemished. He's what John the Baptist calls the lamb of God, right? This 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 is God's lamb. And and that point on the crucifixion yeah, the, the 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 Roman soldiers, when when the person was presumed to be dead on the cross, right? When when they took him down to, to to test whether or not the person was dead, they 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 broke the leg, right? They broke a part of the body, and in this unique case, they didn't, right? In this one unique case, they they did not. Exactly. Yeah, it's that foreknowledge of God playing out there, and really the yeah, the providence of God. Excellent. Can, can, so. Go ahead. Well, and, and so and so the uh, to to mark the, um, the the flight from Egypt. Explain the sprinkling of the blood over the doorstep. That's right. So the Passover lamb would be uh, killed the essentially the night before or the night of Passover, um, and with the blood of the lamb, they were to mark the doorposts and the lintel of the door. Um, with the blood of the lamb. And in Exodus, it says that, uh, you know, the, the angel of death will, will pass over the homes when he sees the, the blood of the lamb on the doorposts. And so you can think of that real close connection also with Jesus Christ and, and the cross that, you know, okay, there are two vertical posts. There's a vertical post and then the lintel, the, the horizontal post of wood right around the door. And wow. it was the, the blood of uh, the Lamb of God, as he said, John John the Baptist pointing to Jesus Christ and saying, "Behold, the Lamb of God," um, and it's it's the blood that was poured forth on the cross uh, that we who have been integrated into the cross uh, by baptism, and then you know if we've lost that grace of, of baptism, uh, we can renew that uh, through the sacrament of confession. Uh, it's when when in a sense we are um, hidden within the cross through those that that we as well um, are able to to make it through the the night our own death and, and enter into eternal life so so th so those Jews were spared by the blood of the lamb right exactly by this ritualistic sacrifice every year that was to be done every year but 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 now we believe as Christians right that that perpetual sacrifice was accomplished by the blood of the one and only firstborn unblemished lamb, the lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Absolutely. You said and, it, and, and, it better for, than I could. For, yeah. Well, and, well, for, for me as an agnostic, I, I just, I, I thought, I thought, oh, now I get it. Now I get it. I, I, I really had to read Hebrews and, so, and some other things to get that. T tell us who Melchizedek was. 
And 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 we mentioned Melchizedek, or not me, but the priest, right, in every mass. That's right. Yeah, Melchizedek is uh, such an interesting character. He he appears um, in the the Abraham cycle. So you know when Abraham is alive, you see in Genesis fourteen. Um, Melchizedek appears and offers sacrifice on behalf of Abraham. And specifically, Melchizedek offers uh, sacrifice of, of bread and wine. Um, wow. And what's really neat is that that he blesses Abraham and, or, and then Abraham tithes to Melchizedek. And so in the logic of, of Jewish priesthood, uh, the person that would offer the sacrifice was the highest of the priests there. And you would tithe to a higher priest. But of course, you know, in within Abraham, you have all of the tribes of Israel. And so even the Levite priesthood, um, or the Aaronic priesthood, um, that high priesthood of the Jewish people, in a certain sense, still asked this other higher priesthood, the priesthood of Melchizedek, um, to offer sacrifice for them and to to and, and they then tithed to Melchizedek. And so you see, first off, all right, Melchizedek is this, this higher priest than any of the Jewish priests. Also, he's referred to as, um, uh, you know, a, a king who has a priesthood that is eternal or an unending priesthood. Um, so so, he, so he's the only priest king <laughs> in, in all of the Old Testament, right? And, and until, and, until you come to and by the way, Abraham is the common father of Jews, Arabs, and Christians, right? Arabs and you know, and Muslims are most Arabs are Muslim. So Arab is the is the common forefather, right? So of all things, so Abraham and Abraham's name is changed from Abraham to Abram, right? Father of many to father Abram to Abraham. Uh, but 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 Melchizedek, yes. Yeah, so and and you see in the institution of the Eucharist, right? That. Um, uh, Jesus Christ in the order of Melchizedek, right? So that's the order that that he's in, the priest priestly king order, correct? Exactly. So, um, all right. The, I, by the way, I, I'm watching the clock here. I know people are going to be disappointed. We have to we have to wrap up in about ten minutes. Everyone's watching this saying, "Well, you've just started. This is good stuff." But um, let me hit a couple of other things here. And Stacy, sorry to cut you off there. Anytime you want to, you want to jump back in, chime in. Uh, the okay, what about the bread of discourse narrative in John six in the in the in the New Testament? And this is I've got it in front of me, so I'll, I'll get you guys. I'll get the two of you started. John six forty one. The Jews then murmured at him because he said, "I am the bread which came down from heaven." They said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How does he say, I have come down from heaven? And then they go back and forth on that. Truly, truly, I say to you who believes has eternal life, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread which I shall give for the life of the world is my flesh." And I know a lot of times, because I was a Protestant, they'll say, well, he's talking here metaphorically. Jesus also calls himself the gate, right? He doesn't actually mean that he's a gate. Yeah, I know, but he doesn't He doesn't say it like this. Okay, hold on. Jews 6.52, or, uh, Jesus, uh, John 6.52. The Jews then disputed among themselves, saying, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? So Jesus said to them, he, he didn't say, Father George, well, wait a second, I'm speaking metaphorically, right? I'm not actually saying that I've given you my flesh to eat. No, Jesus said, uh, truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my uh, blood has eternal life. I will raise him on the last day. Then John 6, 55, for my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. And by the way, hearkening back to the Old Testament, they ate the lamb, right? They ate it. They ate the lamb. It was that they actually ate it. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Uh, this is the bread which came down from heaven. Uh, and, then, and then many of his disciples, when they heard this, this is a hard saying. Who can listen to it? Jesus, knowing that his disciples were murmuring, said to them, Do you take offense to this? So they argue back and forth on this, and then uh, he said, 
And this is John 6, 6, 6. After this, many of his disciples drew back and no longer walked with him. Jesus said to the twelve, will you also go away? Simon Peter answered, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. So by the way, at that point, Jesus could have said, you know, wait, wait, where are you going? I'm talking metaphorically. Remember how I describe myself as like a gate on a hinge? <laughs> That's, I'm just saying that here with the bread. I'm not actually saying I'm the bread. Don't get all worked up. No, he doubles down and triples down, right? He says, are you going to go too, right? So um, sorry about my extended commentary there. Anything you could add to that, please, um, please do. No, I think you did a, a really great job there. Just to to emphasize kind of the escalating nature of what happens. You, you, you quoted it there in John 6, 41. Uh, it says, the Jews then murmured at him. And then, you know, he kind of responds and he says, no, you guys are getting it. I, I meant what I said. Then John 6, 52, the Jews then disputed among themselves saying, how can this man give us, give us his flesh to eat? And then he, he says it even stronger. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, right? That truly, truly, amen, amen. Truly, truly. Um, yeah. It's kind of, it's the, you know, it's, it's almost Jesus parlance for, hey, guys, pay attention. What I'm saying is important, right? And he says it, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoa. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. You know, I, I can't think of another stronger way that Jesus would say that his flesh is true food and his blood is true drink. You know. Yeah, you shall not have you shall not have life within you, right? I mean, this is really you. I, I, I'm not saying to go there, but for uh, for non Catholics, right? Think about that. If um, if what Catholics are saying here about this is correct, right? Then in a way, you've really you've really got to have the sacrament of of the Eucharist, which is which is of course not to say that you can't be a Christian and follower of Jesus. We, we're not saying that. But it's one of the reasons why Catholics say that you really need the sacraments of the church and full communion with the church to be like, to, to re receive fully, quite literally, right, receive what Christ can offer. Yeah, that's right. Uh, no, and, and science will never say truly, truly. You know, science is not going to give you that kind of certainty. And, and I think that's the beauty of where a person who reads this book will come out. Like, it's a gift that Father Elliot lays out the arguments from scripture and tradition. And in a time when most people are tend to think that science has all the answers and scripture and tradition, that's the old stuff. It's so refreshing to, to have all of that laid out and science in its place at the end. Nobody loves chemistry more than I do. You won't find someone that does. But but I love the fullness of the truth that our Catholic faith brings us, that, that we have all of these words of Christ, and we have confidence and certainty in what he said, and we have confidence that God could work a miracle anytime. And it, it ought to make us less dependent on needing the miracles to be true and open to all the miracles that happen in our daily life, just like the fact that we even came together to write this book. Uh, we very much felt the providence of God in being led to do this. I don't think we either one were really wanting to do it at first. <laughs> and um, here we are. So. Well, I, I, I think this is, I think this is um, providential then how this interview came together. Cause I was going to start with part one, but to start with part three, and so, Stacy, this brings us really full circle then to your main point, which is um, even if the three miracles that you looked at, you can't say definitively, you know, in, in the year in the 21st century, a couple decades into the 21st century, that um, science can necessarily prove this or that. But um, but after you go through the book, part one and part two, and you see it historically, you see it theologically. And we even mm -hmm. talk about like Ignatius of Antioch and so forth, yeah. who actually knew John, right, of, of all things, actually knew St. John and believed it was the real presence. But 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 you know, in a way, you don't have to have science today prove something that allegedly happened in the year 750. Right. Um, that yeah. that's that's not what we what we need right now. And we don't even need to look to science to do that. I get that's 
a, a yeah. theme that you're that you're saying here. Yes, and it, it's a theme that I learned from Father Stanley Yaki, and I understand that it can be kind of controversial. Um, and I want people to understand, I'm not at all saying these miracles didn't happen. I'm saying right. that the science is pretty wimpy in what it can tell us. Um, and and we can both believe the miracles happened, but we should we should never put our faith on trial with science. That's the la- that's where we end up with the book. Don't put your faith on trial. Um, some of these investigations probably wouldn't hold up very well in a in a court of law anyway. That that's how um, much we could improve on how we do these investigations. And I've already gotten people calling saying, "Well, let's do the investigations the right way." I don't right. think I'm going to go down that path in my life, in my life, but because yeah. uh, I have other things I'm working on. But yeah, I mean, we, we could do a better job of the investigations. But you could say this, right? So uh, it's too late for something that happened in 750, right? Yeah. You have per- mm-hmm. perfectly captured it and preserved it at the time. But now, or even something yeah. that's happened in the last 20 years, right? Um, where you saw actual alleged bleeding of of a host yeah. or something. I mean, this is where it's now time to grab it and do it right. You know, get out video cameras, yeah. get the scientific experts. And so if, if yeah. I could encourage the two of you, you need to do a sequel to this book. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you need to look, look at some of the, the other cases that are allegedly or reportedly out there today, because there's a bunch of those, no? Yeah, yeah. There are other ones. And I say that at the end of the book, you know, like, what would it take? I don't spell it all out, but I I allude to it. What would it take to come up with a universal process whenever there is a miracle that happened? Um, Don't leave it up to individual dioceses. to to, We we could publish a protocol for investigating Eucharistic miracles. Um, And and that might help going forward. Uh, We'll Will the church actually do that? I I don't know. I don't know if it's worth it because there's always going to be so many questions that can be asked. But for sure, what I would hope is that we we take more caution in how we repeat these stories of the miracles. And maybe if we're going to express our awe and wonder to people who are thinking about taking the leap of faith, let's point the awe and wonder to Jesus Christ before we point it to science. Yeah, by the way, so the same is true, not just for Eucharistic miracles, but miracles generally, right? Like yes. nobody right now can prove that, um, you know, physically or through science, the miracle of the sun on October 13th, 1917, right? right? And we have 70,000 witnesses, right? Um, allegedly, but but you know, no one, there were no video cameras there. We, you know, we don't have uh, DNA evidence or anything like that. So this is true of a lot of these different things. Um, yeah. So, well, look, we, we got to stop it there, but Dr. Stacy Trasankos and Father George Elliott, the book, uh, if you could put it up there, Steve, on the screen, Behold, It Is I, Scripture, Tradition, and Science in the Real Presence, available through TAN Books, and uh, this is this is a book that you got to get. You got to get your hands on it. So, Stacy and Father George, thank you very much for joining us. Thank, thank you. you thank you, Steve. Thank- and can you tell me, do either of you have a, a website or anywhere we could go follow you? Stphilipinstitute.org, um, Bishop Strickland's Institute for Teaching the Faith. Good. Catholic-link.org is a good place to uh, check out as well. Okay, good. Steve will put those up on the screen. And uh, thanks again, both of you, for all that you Thank do. You. And Father George and the spirit of the Order of Melchizedek. <laughs> right carry carry thanks, carry carry on all right thanks so much and everybody thanks. thanks for joining us again this week and we'll talk to you again soon bye-bye